Good evening, everybody. It's a real pleasure for me to be here. Um, and I'm really excited to tell you a little bit about one of the technologies that I think is going to change Web3, but also I think it's just going to fundamentally change the internet. Um, so, you know, this is, this is, of course, the punchline is in the slide title, Zero Knowledge Cryptography. I'm going to explain, the purpose of this talk is to explain a little bit about what Zero Knowledge Cryptography is. Um, give kind of some, you know, give a, give a motiv motivating example, kind of trace the lineage of zero knowledge cryptography and from its academic beginnings to its applications today, and then talk a little bit about some of the use cases. What are those applications and how is this used? Okay, cool. Um, oh, I made these slides. I was just I was just telling someone earlier. I made this slide in Markdown. It's on HackMD. For those of you who don't know, HackMD is just a little nice little Markdown editor. Um, if you want to keep the slides for a few for the future, I think they may have been printed, but. This QR code is also, you know, can give you access to slides. You can follow along as I talk if you want. And I would encourage you, if you have any questions or comments about the content, uh, any suggestions for other, other ideas of what to include in this deck, um, please include it here. So like HackMD, you can leave comments, et cetera. So um, I spent way too much time when I originally made this slide deck trying to figure out how to make it work in HackMD. So I hope someone like participates on, you know, leave some comments because it'll make it all that all that time worth it instead, you know, and, and will make me feel better about the fact that I did this instead of doing it in Google Slides, which I probably should have done. Um, anyway, cool. So a little bit about me. Um, I as so I, I was just, uh, you know, you guys heard my bio, but, you know, like I said, it's a pleasure for me to be here and particularly to talk about Web3 because I um, when I was here at Stanford, I was in, in the MBA program and I started the Stanford Blockchain Club. So Stanford Blockchain Club, I Think uh, how many people are here who are, are part of or have participated in the Stanford Blockchain Club? Okay, wow. So that's about twenty times more people than showed up to most of my meetups at the time. Um, but uh, no, it's been it's I've, I've been able to watch it since graduating. So I graduated in Stanford in twenty nineteen. I've, I've been able to watch it and meet a lot of people from the club since then, and I, I've been able to see it really grow and kind of prosper. So I'm really really excited that that's a community that's thriving here, and I'm excited that that people are getting something out of it. So. Um, yeah, and I think it's also maybe maybe I can also kind of highlight two things before we get started in the talk. How did I get into Web three, and then how did I get into the zk space? So I got interested in Web three and cryptocurrencies actually through my work in the U.S. Army of all things. So like I said, I went to the U.S. Military Academy. I studied nothing to do with computer science or tech or anything. I studied political science and Arabic, and um, did a number of things while in the service, but my last deployment was working in, uh, in Turkey in 2015, 2016, training um, Syrian rebels to fight against ISIS and, and the Syrian regime. And a lot of folks that I worked with there had um, been forced to flee from their homes and were refugees in, in, in Turkey, effectively. And some of them had chosen to volunteer to fight, you know, and try and like, you know, um, you know, fight to reclaim their homes back in Syria. But what struck me about that experience was many of these folks had played by the rules their whole lives as they understood them, and then lost everything one day when the rules changed. It's like civil war broke out, battle lines were drawn. Depending on what side of the road you lived on, kind of determined whether you could wake up one morning and find a barrel bomb falling on your house and your, and, and your family. Right? And so many of these people did the only logical thing that you could do, which is pick up and flee. You know, if you think about if you, you know, loved ones, you, know, you of course want to preserve their lives. First and foremost is pick up and flee, and then so many of them packed everything they had, drove to the northern border, crossed into Turkey, only to find that their life savings, which they'd either accumulated in the form of like real property or in the form of Syrian pounds, was not, <laughs> not worth anything when you cross an international border, right? Either you just didn't have the real property with you or the Syrian pounds were not legal tender in Turkey, right? And this is something we often take for granted, or at least I did, when I was, you know, when I first, you know, went there and, and had this experience, because you know, dollars are kind of like good everywhere, right? You go any basically anywhere in the world and you you can pay in US dollars and it's not really an issue. But that's not true for most people most of the time. And particularly in these situations like Syria, like places like Venezuela, or even in Turkey, uh, in the last few years where there's been a lot of inflation, like a lot of people don't have that same strong currency and those same strong institutions to rely on like we do here. And so I learned about Bitcoin while there from a Turk, actually, and the idea of a, a bank account in your head that was secured by a private key or a seed phrase, um, you know, was what really, what, what really captured me and what really kind of led me down this path of, uh, of pursuing a career in Web3 and crypto. Um, by show of hands, actually, can I get who, what's the makeup of the students in here in terms of like uh, focus area? So first of all, is this, so un, under, 
undergrad, masters. Can we get like, who's an undergrad? Okay, who's a master's student? Okay, who's, an, who's a non-engineering student? Who is an engineering student? Okay, so we got like a pretty, this is a pretty good mix. Okay, awesome. Um, so this talk's gonna be pretty high level. So I hate to disappoint any of you, all of you engineering students, but I highly recommend, um, if you're interested in this topic, I'm sure you've already heard this. You know, there's many great courses here. My, you know, I'm very biased because the, the person I learned this topic from is a CS professor, uh, Dan Bonet, and I highly recommend his class. Just don't do what I did. And the first, the first CS class I ever took in my life was CS 255, Introduction to Cryptography. So I would recommend you not start with that. But if you do want to learn more about this topic, and I highly encourage everyone who's interested in Web3 to learn more about cryptography, it's a great course, and he has many grad students, so I'm sure I think uh, I teach that now. So anyway, so that's how I found myself in Web3 and, and was interested in blockchain. Uh, and actually, this is a good segue to talk, speaking about Professor Dan Bonet. Uh, I was in his course as, as a business student here, and uh, he, unbeknownst to me, happened to be an advisor to A16Z when they were just starting their crypto fund. Um, and he sent me an email before class one day, uh, I think after I'd gotten like a D or something on a project, because again, first computer science class, uh, and a D probably should have been an F minus given, you know, there's a little bit of great inflation probably was happening there. Um, but anyway, he sent me an email, said I wanted to talk to you and, you know, was a little worried I was going to not be invited back to class, but it turned out that he, you know, just wanted to make an introduction for me for an analyst role they were hiring for at A16Z. So the, very fort the point I want to make, it was a very fortuitous uh, moment for me. It changed the trajectory of my career and my life and was very fortunate to go to work on the investing side at A16Z. I had worked a little bit before that at Coinbase and, and at GGV Capital, as was mentioned on the slide. But for me, it was really changed the trajectory of my career. I was very privileged to be able to work there with the amazing folks on the crypto team. At the time, there were only like seven of us on the crypto team, and now there's like 700 people or whatever. Um, but um, as much as I enjoyed that experience, I really wanted to, to um, go to a startup and have a be an entrepreneur effectively. And I know this is a class not only about Web3, but also about entrepreneurship. So as we go through this, uh, this content, I hope to kind of weave in a little bit of what my experience has been, both being on the investment side and seeing entrepreneurs and their struggles to build their companies, but also now being on the other side, being an operator. And I did not start as the CEO of Alio, which is the company that I joined after A16Z about two and a half years ago. But you know, I have been running it now for the better part of a year, and have, I was the first non-founder employee, so I've seen it grow from the ground up. And I guess just for everyone, for everyone, for everyone's information, this talk is not about Alio, but Alio does use zero-knowledge cryptography, and it was that fact that inspired me to join it. And it's basically the idea is it's uh, building a, we're building a new layer one blockchain that uses zero-knowledge cryptography to secure and to scale Web3. And we're gonna I'm going to talk about what that means in the context of zero-knowledge cryptography. But if you're interested in that, I can talk a little bit more about it during the Q&A. OK, with that out of the way, the motivation for this talk. So like I said already, uh, ZK, the shorthand for zero-knowledge cryptography, is going to change the way we interact online. Why is that? I'm going to talk about it in a minute. But at a high level, you can think of it as being able to prove so it's a technique to prove something without revealing why it's true. And it's a fundamentally game-changing paradigm for the following reason. Like imagine playing poker and you're playing, you know, it's, it's, I don't know how many people here have played poker, but you know, the idea is you draw a hand of cards, and depending on you know the makeup of your hand, you can potentially, you know, certain hands are better than others, and you can win a bet effectively, right? So for anyone who doesn't play poker, I think that was a terrible explanation, but hopefully you kind of follow me. Um, and you know, to make that game work, at the end of the round of betting, you need to show your hand to your opponent, right? They need to be able to verify your claim that you have a certain hand of cards, right? And that's the only way up to up until we've, you know, cryptographers discovered this technique. This was the only way to verify that what someone was claiming was in fact true, right? But with the advent of zero knowledge cryptography, you basically have the ability to prove that you have a certain hand of cards without revealing why it's true. It's like it doesn't have a physical analog, but it has many, many applications, both in Web3 and in Web2. Um, okay. Given to give, with that introduction, I'm going to give a short history of ZK and how it came to be. How did cryptographers come up with this? Um, so, yeah, this is not going to start with a bad dad joke, although I do have a large uh, roster of bad dad jokes. Um, so cryptographers, this, this problem was motivated by, uh, I don't want to say laziness, but maybe a little bit of laziness on the part of, uh, of theoretical cryptographers and mathematicians who you know, are constantly reviewing everyone, each other's work and they're like, okay, 
you know, I, I, this guy, you know, Bob down the hall said he has a proof for, you know, some amazing new theorem or something like that. And it's like, well, it's 25 pages. That's a lot of reading. And, you know, I want to go, I, I, you know, I want to go have a beer. I want to go do something else. And so is it, do I really have to read all 25 pages of this to be convinced that this work is true, right? So this is the theoretical foundation for zero-knowledge cryptography was this concept of, of interactive proofs. It's like, okay, Give, and this is, I, it, I'm, I gave you a tangible example, but this is, motive, this is kind of you know, described in, in theory in the papers that have talked about IP. But the idea of IP is basically like, I have a long transcript, and I don't want to read the whole transcript for you, to you for you to understand that I know what I'm talking about. Right? So you imagine two parties. So one person has a claim, and then the other party basically asks questions to the person with the claim. And after a certain number of rounds, that person can be convinced that the claim is true, even and, and the transcript of the interaction should be shorter than the statement being proven. That's really the key thing, right? That's why I kind of said it was motivated by, not laziness, but maybe efficiency, right? You're like, I, I want to ask some questions and know whether you're telling the truth without necessarily having to read the whole thing myself, right? So this is called, this is, you know, r roughly speaking, these are what interactive proofs are. So in the parlance of cryptography, we say there's a prover and a verifier. The prover is trying to prove a claim. The verifier is asking questions, and I'll, at the end of the, at the end of that inter interaction, the verifier accepts or rejects. And this it turns out like I don't know who here is a computer science student. Anyone? Okay, cool. So in what's I think it's the CS one hundred and three is the theory course, right? Is that still true? Okay, cool. So you know it turns out uh, interactive proofs apply to an, a gigantic range of problems, right? So IP, the famous theorem is IP equals P space for those in, in, who've taken CS103. So basically, like, for anyone who's not in the CS curriculum, you, you can basically convert many, many types of very hard problems into an interactive proof problem, right? So it's really, it's a really, really interesting result, and it has a lot of applications. And so the TLDR for this talk in the context of ZK is that even though it's, it's a slightly weird way of referring to, of, of designing problems or applications, you can convert a lot of applications that we would care about into this context. Okay, this slide kind of got a little cut off, which is unfortunate, but um, yep, yeah, this is something what I already kind of talked about. This is basically what it is. So Alice is the prover, Bob is the verifier. So Alice claims something, Bob's gonna ask some questions. This round, this repeats over and over. And then the interaction, again, the key thing is that the interaction, the transcript of that interaction is shorter than the claim itself. Okay. The key properties here uh, for interactive proofs, we have completeness, which is that, okay, every, everything I can make a claim about, I can, also have, I can also prove in this scheme, right? And soundness is that I cannot make any false claim that is verified correctly, right? And then the interesting thing here, and we'll talk about this in a minute, is, this is these two claims are not quite equal. You should be complete, like the, the, the proof system should be complete with 100% certainty, like there's, there's ab absolutely every statement can be proven, but the soundness is kind of pro it's probabilistic, right? So with a vanishingly low probability, can anyone generate a false proof? And what cryptographers also realized is that you can actually apply this, this idea, which has no privacy-preserving properties at all, but you can make it privacy-preserving if you apply some kind of cryptographic primitives to this interaction, right? And this is where the zero-knowledge comes from, right? So zero knowledge proofs have a, a fundamental intellectual and academic basis in this work of interactive proofs. And so this is actually the uh, original paper um, where this idea was proposed. And so these are um, two MIT cryptographers who ended up winning, I think, the Turing Award. Um, and this paper was published, I believe, in 1980. But the idea was like, OK, we have this kind of interesting interactive proving protocol. What if we kind of tweak it a little bit in you know, ways that I'm not going to get into, but the, I guess the upshot for everyone here is that let's apply some cryptography to it to make the interaction basically hidden. And so at the end of the interaction, someone can come up with a proof without sharing the transcript and say, hey, this is correct. This claim is correct. Cool. Um, this is just kind of more for you know, general interest for anyone who's curious. Zero knowledge proofs come in all kinds of flavors, and so I'm kind of I want to trace here the beginning, like the initial kind of ideas and and the first iteration of zero knowledge proofs, all the way up to what are most commonly deployed today, which are zk snarks and their variety of flavors. So interactive proofs plus this zero knowledge property uh, is called sigma protocols. So this is this is like kind of the original form of zk. An interesting sigma protocol 
that maybe some of you have heard of is the Schnorr signature scheme. So Schnorr is used, I think, now in Bitcoin and in a couple other protocols. Um, if you take Sigma protocols, and Sigma protocols are inherently interactive, and you can apply a technique called Fiat Shamir, which is basically like the hand wave version is like you simulate a transcript of a verifier asking questions by just hashing. Uh, you basically use a hash function to give like effectively a random, you know, you randomize a verifier's list of questions, right? You can simulate the verifier with the hash function effectively, and that gets you non-interactive zero-knowledge arguments, and that's what those are called NISICs. And then if you take NISICs and apply <laughs> an emoji, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. If you, if you take NISICs and you apply this, you know, some, some kind of specialized cryptography that really is all about compressing that interaction, you get a word called ZK Snarks. And ZK Snarks, I think I actually even have the acronym defined here. Yes. Zero knowledge, succinct, non-interactive argument of knowledge. By the way, uh, there's an amazing potential roster of Web3 trivia questions. So brainstorm idea for anyone who's running like a blockchain club event. You can do, you can do uh, acronym trivia uh, and just come up with, so there's some really amazing acronyms out there that make no sense at all. Um, and this one is probably one of the more sensical ones, but as you can see, it's a mouthful. So let's walk through this one at a time, or one, one word at a time, so we all understand what we're talking about here. Uh, zero knowledge. So the zero knowledge, I think we explained. Succinct is really important. The succinctness here is that the interaction is smaller than the actual, uh, than the actual claim itself, right? So uh, whatever computation is being proven, the proof is smaller in size than that. Non-interactive means that you don't actually need to have two parties engaging with each other. And then argument of knowledge is basically just a claim, right? So this is a claim that I know something. OK. Um, yeah, so I've mentioned Schnorr protocols already. This is kind of like another visualization of uh, the evolution of Sigma from Sigma, pro so, excuse me, Sigma protocols to ZK Snarks. And on this slide, this might be where you start to recognize something or some, some uh, systems you may be more familiar with if you're familiar with Web3, right? So we kind of had Schnorr protocol which is a signature scheme developed in the 90s. And PCPs are something called prob probabilistically checkable proofs. Uh, I'm not going to get into what those are, but those were really the precursors for these various proof systems. And these are all like these words on the right side here in the 2010s are all based on basically titles of papers that proposed various proof systems uh, to use zero knowledge. And every, every zero knowledge proof system, like all these names here, Pinocchio, Grau 16, Planck, Starks, Marlin, like the way to think about zero knowledge proofs is they kind of consist of two components. There's a commitment scheme, which is basically like the, the part that makes sure that the prover can't cheat. And there's this interactive oracle proof system, right? Which is basically like uh, the means in which the prover and the verifier, or the means in which the prover answers questions, right? So those two things can be combined. And in fact, these different primitives, the PCP or the, poly, or sorry, the poly, polynomial commitment scheme and the IOP can be combined in different ways. And that's why you have these kind of different flavors of proof systems. So, Groth 16 was one of the first ones that really came to prominence, and it's named for a cryptographer, Jens Groth, who authored the paper in 2016. And uh, it was first, it was actually popularized by Web3, and specifically Zcash, uh, which used it, I believe, in the Sprout protocol. Uh, and they've moved on from that to, to using Halo 2 now, which is also mentioned on the bottom. And these other ones here are some other kind of flavors of ZK proof systems that are used in Web3. So Starks, many of you have heard of, probably heard of Starkware. So Starkware is um, founded by most of the researchers that invented Starks, which are a subset of Snarks, to be clear. Does anyone know what Starks stand for, by the way? OK, a succinct, transparent argument of knowledge. So again, like I said, lots of good acronyms for trivia, uh, for bar trivia. Um, Planck and Marlin are two other systems that are pretty widely deployed. Uh, OK, cool. What are they good for? So like I mentioned earlier at the beginning, like what was the motivation for this? Before we had this technology and this technique, there's this fundamental tension between I know something and I can verify something, right? Like before, in order for you to verify that I knew something, I had to basically prove it to you and physically show you what the thing was, right? But now with this scheme, and I, I, this is obviously more abstract because we're speaking in the digital sense now, I can prove to you that I know something without revealing why it's true. Um, kind of this don't trust but verify. And the two applications for this in Web3, which we're going to talk more about when we get to the use cases here in a few minutes, is they conceal and they compress information. I think I have some little colors going on here. There we go. Um, it's important to note that they do both of these things because in different Web3 protocols, not every Web3 protocol that uses zero knowledge takes advantage of both of these properties. Like, for example, who, who in this room knows, has heard of a ZK rollup? 
Okay, great. So ZK rollups are a form, it's, it's a technique for scaling Ethereum. Uh, layer two, it's a layer two construction. And in that construction, you, they don't really use the ZK property, right? The, the, the part that conceals information, right? The, the application of a ZK snark in that specific architecture is to compress computation into a succinct proof that is, is verifiable, right? So that's like, it's the compression property of snarks that is desirable in the context of a rollup, whereas the concealment is more, is more used in places such as like Zcash, right? So Zcash uses uh, the ZK property of ZK snarks to kind of conceal who is interacting with who, but there's really no compression that's used in that protocol. So like I said, different Web3 protocols will apply, you know, kind of use either of these properties, but not necessarily both. Okay, cool. So now we're going to talk about some use cases. Um, let's see. So the first use case, and by the way, actually, maybe before I get to that, um, I, I'm a huge believer in Web3 and blockchain technologies. But I think that what we've seen today in terms of the many, many interesting categories that have kind of come out of Web3, so we have between NFTs, DeFi, decentralized gaming, probably 10 of the things that I haven't been paying attention to. Really, at this point, everything has been very um, preliminary. And yeah, I think preliminary is the best way to put it. And I, and I would argue that one of the reasons why the space has not taken off more than it, than it, than it has is because we don't have the ability to keep information private in the system. If you think about the context of Ethereum, for example, let's just take an easy example. Like, who in here has an ENS address? Okay, so if I go, to, if, if, if I ask you, I won't, I won't make you dox yourself here on, the, on camera, but like if I ask you for your ENS address, then we could just go to Etherscan right now, type it in, it will resolve to an Ethereum address, or an ENS name will resolve to an, to an Ethereum address, and then we can just see every interaction you've ever had with that wallet on the Ethereum blockchain. Like, if you think about comparing that to like how modern finance works, it's insane. It would be as if like I could just ask anyone for like, you know, what's your name, and then I could just find your bank account and see everyone you've ever paid and however much you've been paid at any job and, you know, what you got your significant other for their anniversary or something like that, right? So I just wanted to point out that it's like, insane, this insane level of transparency really inhibits a lot of broader use cases for the technology. I think, and this is why I think you see kind of this renewed, constantly renewing interest in this concept of like blockchain, but not Bitcoin, blockchain without the, the cryptocurrency, private blockchains, right? One prominent project, which spectacularly failed. Actually, did you guys talk to the Miston protocol guys? Did they come in, yeah. Evan? So yeah, so Evan's probably more qualified than, than me to talk about this, but Libra was kind of like one of these things, right? We're like, oh, we'll have like a kind of a blockchain without the currency. I mean, that was a weird situation, but this, this was kind of motivated by this idea where it's like, hey, for this to be really practical on a wide scale, we need to be able to give users the ability to conceal some level of information from at least some people in the system, right? Because otherwise, a real, real, I would posit, real economic use cases be it in the NFT space or DeFi or whatever, are really not possible. So with that in mind, let's look at some use cases for uh, ZK. One of the most obvious ones, I think, is regulated stablecoins. Um, so yeah, like I said, the traditional financial world is really private by default. Payments are obviously a huge industry that many crypto protocols are trying to break into. And why, why is crypto even being considered here? Well, it's because the rails are universal, right? So if you Think about SWIFT, you know, it, takes, it can take days sometimes for you to settle payments across borders. And so it's very inefficient, very costly, lots of money is spent to do that. Blockchain solve that problem by being this, this kind of universal payment rails, right? Obviously things like Ethereum, you know, you have this programmability layer, you can issue things like stable coins, be they, you know, decentralized kind of MakerDAO style stable coins or USDC kind of more centralized, uh, you know, uh, managed stable coins. And the cool thing about using ZKPs here is you can just basically replicate the experience of cash, yet except in a digital sense, right? So you can replicate this experience where like I can pay you or anybody and like no one in the system has to know that I did. If I buy a coffee, no one has to know what kind of, you know, that I like pumpkin spice lattes or something, you know? 
Um, and you know, it seems like that's a trivial example, but many, many companies like would never submit to having their contracts become fully public with suppliers, for example, right? And so stable coins, of course, by virtue of the fact they're stable, they're matching to a existing currency. Um, you know, this is, it's a very, probably the most prominent use case in crypto for payments. And you can apply ZKPs to really get kind of the nice properties you get out of cash. And as a result, hopefully empower and create a much broader, um, you know, kind of economic activity. Um, I think we cut off the bottom there. Um, yeah, I'm going to come back to the government's point in a minute. So I have the fourth bullet here is governments think this is bad. I'm going to come back to this in a minute because I want to spend, I think, a whole slide on it. Um, dark pools uh, or just OT on-chain OTC markets. and yeah, Or you could even actually think of it as regulated ICOs. Um, does anyone remember ICOs? I mean, yeah, okay. So, uh, no, yeah, no, one should, no, one, no one who was in any ICOs share your Ethereum address because we'll find out how much of a degen you are. Um, just kidding. I'm, I've been in my fair share of degen ICOs, so uh, full disclosure. But the, um, you know, the, like, you could imagine an ICO, okay, so ICO's got a really bad rap, so like, okay, everyone's just raising money with, without flatting all the standards, but you could imagine doing an ICO where like, hey, I want to issue some kind of asset that maybe I know is a security, and I want to make sure the only people that can buy it are KYC, right? So this is kind of, this is a use case here where we're like, hey, I want to make sure I can verify that users are KYC here, and, but, you know, users are like, well, do I want to put my passport data on the blockchain or inside of an Ethereum transaction? No, so you can use a zero-knowledge proof to basically gate certain types of applications here, right? And, and one of those applications would be like OTC desks and dark pools. And dark pools, for those of you who don't know, it's this, um, this idea that exists in finance where you basically have like uh, a bunch of different uh, people who are trading assets and they don't, wanna, don't necessarily want to reveal their identities to each other. And they don't want it to become public knowledge, the, the type and amount of the securities they're selling so they don't like slip the price or whatever. Um, cool. Another very relevant example of applications for ZK crypto is proof of solvency. So I'm assuming all of you have heard of FTX. I mean, you'd have to be living under a rock to not have heard about it at this point. Uh, sadly, a, um, you know, uh, someone who I think is probably, maybe people know personally since he was, his parents are obviously professors here, but you know, without applying any personal judgment there, and there's many, many examples of institutions in crypto and outside of crypto, by the way, uh, that, fail constantly because they they don't they're insolvent right these are financial systems that are fundamentally insolvent and Dan Bonet actually one of the first use cases of zero knowledge proofs that was not necessarily in web3 for payments was a, uh, the uh, cryptography lab here at Stanford came up with this concept of proof of solvency right so if you're an exchange or a bank let's say right you want to be able to prove that you're solvent without showing everyone your balance sheet why would you not want to show them your balance sheet well because you know, depending on the type of activities you're doing, like people may read into it and they may decide to sow our favorite acronym, fear, uncertainty, doubt. And then, you know, to, to a large extent, like that is what precipitates bank runs, right? And then you are, in fact, insolvent, even if you weren't to begin with, right? So this proof of solvency has been an area that I think is really ripe to revisit in crypto in light of the many institutions that were insolvent last year that precipitated arguably the biggest bear market that, uh, that we've seen for the last few years. Um, Cool. I mentioned a minute ago that there is this is useful technology not just for payments and Web3 stuff, but also for Web2. So I think, actually, ZK is already deployed today, believe it or not, in some applications like password managers, right? So, um, you know, in that, in that case, like your master password, the way it works is like there's a, you know, like LastPass, for example, you know, has this encrypted database uh, online, you know, in one of their servers of all your passwords. And then your master password is basically the, you know, the key to encrypting it. And you don't actually send that, that, that never leaves your device that lives locally. And you just generate a zero knowledge proof that you know that master password. And that is basically the mechanism for authenticating to the server to give you access to your encrypted records, which contain your passwords. And so this is, this paradigm can be applied all over the place. Who cares? And why would we care about that? Well, uh, this is, I think, one of the most underrated use cases because the way passwords work today, many of you probably know, what's supposed to happen is you enter in your password. It's supposed to be hashed client-side and then sent to a database, which is supposed to apply some other techniques like salts and peppers and stuff when they store that on a server. But the reality is that often doesn't happen. So when they inevitably get hacked, a bunch of passwords get leaked because they were stored in the clear or something, and then you're pwned, right? And fundamentally, this will never change because... The asymmetry between the cost of protecting all this data and following the correct policies 
is always going to be exceeded by the potential profit from being clever and subverting those defenses, right? So there's this, because we are concentrating our data in this very centralized way, there's, it's basically always going to be a huge honeypot. And so the nice thing about the example I just shared with you where you know a secret, you're proving that you know it, but that the, fun, the underlying secret never leaves your possession, like that basically distributes out all of these secrets into each individual client's hands, and therefore there's not really one single honeypot to go after. So I think it's actually a fundamentally much better scheme when you think about it from a computer security perspective. Self-sovereign identity. Um, so this is another really kind of big idea that goes just outside, beyond crypto. Um, it's this concept of like, you know, we all, I, an identity is kind of an amorphous concept, but this is basically mapping a real world identity to the digital world, which again has become really relevant in the current day or in, in present day in light of AI, right? So chat GPT. Um, how many people here have used chat GPT to write an essay for a class? Don't, don't, no, don't, don't raise your hand. It's lying. <laughs> I said, almost got you. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, like, it, it, kidding aside, right, like, the amount of content generated by AI has grown exponentially just in the last six months, and it will continue to grow exponentially over in the coming years, right? And it's going to become increasingly important for people to try and identify and understand what is a bot and, and who is a person, right? Who, what is a bot and who is a person? And this is, you know, identity, self-sovereign identity, being able to prove your humanity in the digital sense, be it on a blockchain or be it on a social media website is going to be increasingly important. But of course, you don't want to just reveal everything. You don't want to just publish your passport data or in the case of like healthcare, right? You don't want to just like publish all your personal health information. You want to be able to conceal some of that while still being able to authenticate effectively um, to gain access to some resource. And this is like self-sovereign identity is kind of a higher order concept, that, but I, I kind of think authentication is like one small part of it. Um, secure voting. This is something that all secure, if Dan were here, he would just immediately stomp out of the room because this is something that all cryptographers and security researchers love to bash. Uh, but I gave a talk at ETH Denver, which is linked here. So if you guys are curious, you can, you can hear it, you can read more in, in depth on my thoughts on why I think um, this can help with secure voting. But fundamentally, like, you know, the idea of voting, at least in a national kind of political election, is you don't want people to know who you voted for <laughs> and you don't want to be able to prove who you voted for even if you want to, right? Um, and without getting into the details, which, I, which again, I said, as I mentioned, are, are, are in this talk, um, the, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of ways to apply zero-knowledge cryptography there to make things more secure. Um, cool. We're coming close to the end here. We've got the last couple slides. Stateless secure, like clients and wallets. So this is like um, Mina Protocol, for example, uses zero-knowledge proofs, again, to compress. But this is really nice because what they're compressing is the state of the whole blockchain. They came up with this really interesting idea where you can basically recursively prove all the way back to the beginning of the Genesis block that everything that happened up to that point is correct. And then all that a light client has to hold is a, state, is a small 22 kilobyte proof, wherein you can know that the state that you have is, as, that's been given to you with that proof is correct, right? And this is a really great primitive tool for building like bridges and, and various more secure light clients. Uh, talked about uh, health data. I'm not, maybe I'll talk about the machine learning bit here. So you can imagine applying zero knowledge to machine learning algorithms, right? And then, you know, either the output that you receive from the algorithm, you can have a proof that says, hey, I gave this, this algorithm some data that I'm not going to reveal to you and I got this output, right? So this is like probably really relevant for health data. And there's a few other ways to apply it for machine learning as well. I'm gonna kind of skip ahead here because I wanna leave a, a little bit of time for questions. Uh, gaming. I said I was going to skip ahead, but I do want to linger on this because I think this is one of the, uh, in the long term, this is one of the most important application areas we're going to see for zero-knowledge cryptography in blockchain specifically. So blockchains are obviously really great at, de at coordinating dis dis distinct groups of people uh, towards a common goal. I think you can apply that to games. There's a lot of examples of blockchain games out there. But Almost all of these games rely on either having some kind of commit re reveal scheme in order to achieve hidden information, or they have a central server. I mean, most multiplayer games today use a central server to basically manage state. Like, I see this part of the map, you see that part of the map, and you know we don't see each other's maps, right? But you can use ZKPs to basically replicate what a central server would do and have hidden information games on chain. And that opens up a much richer category of games 
that, you know, again, because of the by virtue of the fact that it's a blockchain and potentially governed by a DAO, players can own. Players can determine, hey, how are the rules going to change? What's the mechanism going to be going forward? How do we incentivize new players to join, right? And so I think this is a really, really exciting area. And the key, how does ZK fit in here? Most of that is related to blockchains in general and the architecture there. But how does ZK relate? Well, you can have these hidden information aspects of it, which is most games that I think are popular today. Um, Dark Forest. Has anyone played the game Dark Forest or is familiar with it? Okay, it's really cool. It basically takes, this is a game, this is actually, it's a game some MIT students created, and it takes place on Ethereum, or it's uh, hosted on Ethereum. I highly recommend everybody check it out. Okay, NFTs. Okay, great. So now, I've hopefully convinced you at this point that ZK cryptography is the most magical thing in the world, and we should all, you know, just cheer for its adoption and be super excited about, you know, all of its magical powers. But... I want to make sure that I present to you kind of the full story here and, and specifically relay some of the challenges surrounding this technology. Like, why hasn't it, if Alex, what you're saying is so great, then why has not the entire world adopted this technology? What's holding it back? Okay, so one of the big things, um, for those of you who've been following the space, you've probably been tracking, there's a lot of hype and excitement around what are called ZK EVMs, right? So this is you know layer two solutions that are roll-ups effectively, but are are uh, programmable and enable to do, do smart contracts in the same way that the native layer one EVM lets you, right? And maybe I guess just for context, for those of you who don't know, kind of the first version of ZK roll-ups, just ZK roll-ups without the ZK EVM. You know, the idea was like you couldn't really do a general program. You basically had to hard code whatever the program was in into the rollup, right? So this is like Stark X, for example, was like this. Um, and there were a couple other first gen rollups that were basically hard coded. Whatever the program was, it could never change. ZK EVMs try and replicate the programmability of Ethereum. So you have this, you have a general idea for what program like you want to deploy on Ethereum, you just write some solidity code, you know, compiles down to EVM bytecode, you deploy that on chain, and then anybody can interact with it. The ZK EVM is trying to do the same thing, but the EVM, for a variety of reasons relating to the, um, the pre-compiled cryptographic primitives that you have access to as a developer there, is kind of really incompatible with the cryptography that's used for efficient zero-knowledge proofs, right? And I'm not going to get into the specifics of why that is, but it has to do with the types of elliptic curves that are fundamentally used and the types of operations, specifically hashing, right? So in Ethereum, uh, the Kachak hash function is really used all over the place. And it turns out that that specific hash function is extremely inefficient to do inside of a zero knowledge proof. There are other hash functions that are much more efficient, but the Kachak function specifically is just really hard. Lack of tooling. Uh, up until recently, I think maybe the last year, if you wanted to write a program, if you wanted to create a program that leveraged zero knowledge cryptography, say you wanted to prove like all these use cases I just mentioned, but you want to prove your identity without revealing you know, what your social security number is. The only way to achieve that was to use a language called Circum, which, is, uh, which was invented by a guy named Jordi Bellina, who's now at Polygon. But it, and it's, it's a really amazing tool, but the problem is it's very, very low level. Like, and the way that, you know, without getting into the details of like how you kind of, how the ZK proofs work, how ZK proofs work under the hood, just you can kind of think of them as like circuits, right? They're often referred to as circuits, right? And Circum was like this circuit language. So you basically were like, you can think of it as like hand wiring physical circuits to achieve the output that you want. That was, that was, if it sounds kind of complicated and low level, it's because it was, and it was a really a pain. And not very many developers, as you can imagine, rushed to adopt this in the same way that people wanted to you know, use JavaScript, right, or something, some, some language like that. So the lack of tooling and really the lack of these domain-specific languages has really hampered the space. Thankfully, now we have many more examples of domain-specific languages uh, for ZK. So Leo, Ali my company, Alio, has developed one called Leo. Uh, Aztec has developed one called Nor. And you know, there's, there's others that are currently in the work. So the tooling is getting better, but still there's a lot of, of tooling missing um, for developers who want to get into the space. Um, the performance overhead. So one thing you should all be thinking is like, wow, I can prove that I executed a program and I don't have to reveal anything about it. You know, like what's the downside? Why would I ever not do that? Well, in terms of resources, it turns out that that takes a lot more resources to do that as, as opposed to what's called native execution or just pro, you know, running the program in the clear, right? You have to spend, in some cases, many orders of magnitude <laughs> more resources to generate the proof than you do to just run the program. 
Uh, and by the way, this, this problem applies to a lot of different advanced cryptography. For those of you who are interested in, in uh, or have heard of things like multi-party computation and, and especially fully homomorphic encryption, this is a much bigger problem there where it's like even small problems are basically completely infeasible because of the overhead. Now, this has gotten much, much better for two reasons. One, the proof systems, such as the ones I highlighted here, Starks and Planck, et cetera, are getting much more efficient in terms of how they take you know, your high-level logic and compile it down into a circuit. Um, but in addition to that, we're also starting to get much better hardware. And you're getting people who are developing algorithms or libraries to take advantage of existing highly performant or you know, high-performance hardware and apply it to this problem in parallel. For example, GPUs. So GPUs are kind of like, well, I guess not even five years ago, everyone was really excited about GPUs for mining, <laughs> mining Ethereum, and also for AI purposes, right? And NVIDIA in particular had a, has the CUDA library, or the CUDA, kind of this CUDA um, um, ecosystem where you can write kind of any program you want and run it in the GPUs. And GPUs are very nice because they let you program a lot of things in parallel, or run a lot of things in parallel, which has some applications for certain parts of the ZK proof generation process. Um, so it's getting better. But for example, still on mobile phones today, if you wanted to generate a proof, in fact, I was just talking to someone who we're working with for Alio for our mobile wallet. If you're generating a proof on a phone, it still takes on the order of minutes in some cases, depending on the application, right? So this is like a lot of overhead and there's a lot of work yet to be done to continue to kind of optimize things and kind of shrink them down to make them performant. And the last thing is data availability, right? So it's, we, when looking at zero knowledge proofs for Web3, uh, and if you actually, maybe this is, a, uh, if any of you decide to go into VC and you want to hear pitches for aspiring Web3 entrepreneurs, one thing uh, that I used to hear all the time was, you know, you're going to, you have this great, amazing system that's going to be hyper scalable. It's going to you know, protect everyone's privacy and secure everything, right? And in many cases, and, you know, and, oh, and by the way, the blockchain was only like one byte big, right? Or something like this, right? Um, and, you know, these are fantastical claims. But one thing that I think is, is we take for granted oftentimes in blockchains like Ethereum is like all of the data about all of the programs and all of the state that we care about is all in the clear, right? So I mentioned a second ago that's a huge drawback. But for, from a programming perspective, it's actually really nice because you don't have to reason about what state the program has access to and what it doesn't, right? You can basically just assume it's like, okay, everything in here is just public and you can just run it, run it straight through as if this is the inside of a real computer, right? When you have this private model where you're dealing with private state, you have to rely on the user to provide the private state, right? And so there's a, it's a slightly different model for building applications in Web3. And data availability is what we call this. It becomes really, really important, not only for the underlying data that you use to compute the proof, but the proofs themselves right, need to continue to be hosted in order for you to verify them, which is why, like in the case of rollups, the data availability layer is the layer one blockchain, is Ethereum, right? And that's where those proofs, those proofs are stored on Ethereum such that anyone can come later and verify the state transitions took place outside of Ethereum, um, but, but they know that proof is always there and available. Okay, I'm going to rush through this here to kind of get to the end so we have time. I think we have maybe five minutes or so. Okay, cool. So we got about, we're doing pretty good. So we have we'll have a few minutes for questions here at the very end. Um, okay, so just talked about zero knowledge proofs. As I've gone through in the beginning of this presentation, there's been a huge amount of development and you know uh, huge advances in the space over the last 30 years, but particularly in the last 10 really driven forward by Web3. So we have this Cameron explosion of proof systems and techniques and optimizations, et cetera, um, all kinds of things really just driving this technology towards the mainstream, right? And so you can, this is, has all kinds of applications in the many use cases I highlighted here. And it also has applications in some of these other, you know, in, in combination with some of these other cryptographic primitives, which we're not going to talk about, but things like multi-party computation, fully homomorphic encryption, you can use all these techniques together in an ensemble to really get, to really achieve kind of this ideal, secure, and, and private uh, computation. Um, okay, cool. So I'm just going to like blaze through here the last couple of closing thoughts I have. So, okay, why is ZK crypto important? If you take nothing away from this, Zero knowledge crypto is important because it lets you prove something without revealing why it's true and it lets someone verify something without seeing the details. Um, and I think the one thing I would leave you with is that's really powerful, but this talk is, or this class is Web3 entrepreneurship and we're all here because Web3 is special. And why is Web3 special? Well, because we have this principle of decentralization. And actually, we don't care about decentralization in Web3, but what we care about is permissionlessness. Let's go back to the very beginning 
when I gave you the motivating example for why I got interested in this space. This is the Syrian refugee who no longer had access to his bank account because he was basically deplatformed by the government because he was accused, not necessarily was, but was accused of being a sympathizer to a rebel group, right? And so that system is not permissionless. It's permission, right? And you can be deplatformed for many, in some cases, even silly reasons in these cases, right? And that's one of the powerful things about blockchains. This is the motivation around behind Bitcoin was this concept of permissionlessness. So even though ZK is amazingly powerful, and even though it has a ton of applications outside of the decentralized world of crypto, I think in the context of crypto, it's important to remember that we can have zero knowledge, but unless we have the permissionless, uh, you know, unless we have these, these properties that give us this, per, this, pro, this, uh, this feature of permissionlessness, you know, we've kind of lost the point at the, end, at the end of it. And so should we, we just should always remember that. Um, and yeah, I guess that on the, kind of on that note is like, you know, I've just emphasized that this is like progress in terms of technology, but you know, fundamentally this is a question of like, do we use these systems? Are we going to allow for a system of digital cash? That's not a technolo technological question. That's a social question. That's a political question. Do we want this to, do we want people to be able to interact on, on, anonymously? Do we want people to be able to keep secrets that no one can read, right? Um, you know, I think we've come a very long way as a species in terms of getting and protecting individual rights, but that progress isn't always guaranteed. And so I would just encourage everyone who's thinking about this and, and in the space to remember that. And this is the last slide. Um, ZK is really hot right now in terms of like the Web3 world, like everybody and their mother is doing, is deploying a new ZK protocol. <laughs> um, some are legitimate, some are not. But nonetheless, like this is, I think it's finally getting the recognition that it really deserves as being a very special technology that can solve a lot of potential issues, not just with Web3, but with Web2. So with that, um, I've got some resources here. If you took a, if, um, if you missed the talk and you want to keep this for your reference, this is the, the QR code for the talk, the resources of the last slide. And thank you all very much for having me. I think we might have time for one, maybe two yeah, questions. Okay, good question, and then, yeah. Cool. So one. All right. So I'll uh, we'll do one question, then we'll see where we stand. Go ahead. Hi. Thank you so much for the talk. I have a question around. You talked about the challenges with proof size and proof generation. Can you give us a few concrete examples across different platforms? Uh, let's say, for example, I want to do a simple transfer. How long would that proof generation be? How, if, for example, I want to deposit or uh, into uh, a lending pool? How much proof size would that be? And lastly, can you also give us an example, a little bit more complex, maybe you know, I'm doing it for you know, swap swap. How would that you know, look like across different platform? Maybe not just for Ali. Or yeah, so I don't have a, knowledge. I don't, Thank you. Thanks, thanks for your question. Um, I, don't have a I don't have concrete numbers for those last two because there's not really an example I could point to where you can deposit into a lending. There's no protocol today that I know of that lets you do that. And so I don't really have a concrete number for you there. But I will say on the payments one, which I do have a concrete number for. Um, the longest running deployed zero knowledge protocol is Zcash. In the beginning, Zcash, and by the way, there's a difference in proof systems, but I'm just going to talk about it in terms of zero knowledge and ZK snarks specifically. The ZK snarks that Zcash uses, which are all based on, um, on R1CS, initially it was Groth 16 and now they use Halo 2. Proofs in the beginning using Pinocchio, which was the first protocol, took about 60 seconds to generate on a relatively performant laptop. And now they are in under, you can do a transfer in under 100 milliseconds, right? So you've basically seen, you've gone from a minute to a tenth of a second, effectively. Um, you've seen kind of a similar improvement on other private ZK systems that do specifically payments. But the thing that I wanted to, you know, again, I don't have the concrete numbers for the other two use cases you mentioned, but the important thing to note when, in, in terms of the resources that are consumed in generating a proof, it's actually, that's not the full story. There's a few different resources you need to consider. And this is, by the way, what really how you get to the difference between things like Starks and ZK Snark, like traditional ZK Snarks and Plonk, et cetera, right? And so the proof generation time in a traditional ZK Snark like Groth 16 is linear in the size of the problem. So you have a bigger problem, it grows in a linear fashion. The advantage of Starks is that that growth in uh, proof proving time is sublinear. I think it's n log n. Um, so you basically have this sublinear growth. So that's why kind of Starks are nice for these bigger problems from the proof size. Now, what's the downside of a Stark compared to a Snark? Well, the verifier time and the proof size, not proving time, grows logarithmically 
which is good, but it's still gross, right? And the smallest proof size you will ever get for a Stark is on the order of kilobytes, whereas for a traditional ZK Snark like what Zcash and Alio use, it's just it's a it's a hundred bytes or something like some much smaller, more compact, right? And so you, this is these are kind of like the different trade offs that all of these are taking. So for example, in Zcash, you know you can generate a proof very quickly, and the proofs are small, and verifying the proof is nice. But if you want to do, let's say, let's imagine we, we were doing an application where we're running like a machine, like a large language model or something. I mean that would take a very long time to do inside of a zero knowledge proof. Or if you want to do a Uniswap trade, right? And what is a Uniswap trade? You're like, hey. I want to purchase, you know, I want to purchase this asset. I have this asset. It's two, it's, you know, Uniswap is a bonding curve. It's a function that relates two balances of asset A and B. And so you have to kind of do some logic around that. I mean, depending on, let's take a ZK EVM based on Starks, right? Like that's still probably a minute. Um, so we're getting to the point where it's getting better, but it's still a little bit too long. And this is why a lot of people are really interested in ASICs for zero knowledge proofs, because it can make, you can take, ASICs can make it much more efficient and much more performant. Does that answer your question? So how long does it take for ALIO to generate a transfer proof? Uh, so ALIO is under a second. Under yep, a second. yep, for a transfer. And uh, yeah, and if you're, if you're curious, we actually have some other concrete numbers for ALIO specifically I could share with you after class. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions? Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, so pr uh, privacy is a problem for the government because uh, it creates a dark side. So uh, uh, some protocols uh, deal with this by tr uh, restricting transfer size, like Aztec. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious what will be strategy of Elio. Uh, yeah, so Elio specifically. So I think, so one of the cool things, um, actually one of the cool applications for zero knowledge proofs and, and, a, pr and a protocol like Elio specifically is I talked about stable coins for a minute, right? So you have like, you know, you can issue a stable coin on Alio. It basically gives you the same power as the EVM does, but in this private setting. But the cool thing about it is, just like USDC on Ethereum, you can encode whatever compliance mechanisms that you want, right? And so you can say like, hey, no transfers over $1,000. Only whitelisted people are allowed to participate. Only whitelisted people for under $5,000, and then maybe everyone else can do 100, right? You can literally dream up any set of rules that you want, and in order to interact in that system, people can just prove that they fulfill those conditions. Now, it doesn't solve every problem, right? You have to basically be able to know, okay, who's on a blacklist and what's that identity and how does it map? So it's not, it's not I, I don't want to like hand wave that problem away. But the point is, I think this is actually from a government and regulatory compliance side. This is way better than what we actually have today. Because if you go to a bank and you go count the number of people that work in the compliance department, it's enormous. In some cases, for some banks, 20% of all of their staff work in compliance. And why is there so many people doing that? Well, because these things aren't even programmatically handled at the level of banks. Most of the time, people have to manually go through transactions to find where the fraud is, to find where the money laundering is. In fact, my former boss, Katie Hahn, who worked at the DOJ and then was at A16Z, like her, the thing she would always do at pitches when people ask this question is like, what's the biggest source of money laundering in the world? Banks, right? It's like it, most people just use banks, right? And they figure out how to subvert the systems that exist in order to do whatever criminal activities they're going to do. And in fact, if you had a system that was based on zero knowledge cryptography, by virtue of the cryptography, like you can't generate, like I said, these systems are, are complete and sound, right? You're not going to be able to generate a false proof. So if you don't fulfill the criteria, you just simply cannot transact. So in that way, I actually think banks and governments should really welcome this. Of course, there's other aspects of this too. And in Alio, we have this concept of view keys and graph keys, right? where I can selectively reveal who I interacted with without revealing the contents, and I can selectively reveal each transaction, kind of give folks a window into that. So we have a lot of different tools to help governments and help developers and, and users comply with the laws that, that they fall under their jurisdiction. But fundamentally, I actually think this is a tool to help improve compliance, not subvert it. Last question. Last question. Yeah. Um, yeah, hello. Uh, quick question. Two quick questions. Uh, number one, what bit security level do you guys target at Alio? Um, you know, just in general for all of the zero knowledge technology that you're doing? That's kind of like a little bit of the technical question. And more on the business side of things. Um, why did you decide um, as a team to deploy essentially Alio as an L1, um, you know, focus on privacy? And perhaps not, you know, just build on top of the Ethereum ecosystem and build something with related technologies, but, you know, that works as a gear roll-up, perhaps. Yep. Um, 
So I actually don't have the answer because it's a subtle answer because the ALIO protocol is many layers deep and I'm, there's security proofs to go with each level and I don't have the confidence enough in all of those levels, like those, you know, how many bits of security in each of those to give you the precise answer. I will say this, it is uh, more than 128. And, and it's, so it's not, <laughs> this is a gotcha, it's not 24 or whatever Starkware's ended up being, right? So that's like the, it is not that. Um, in fact, so we have uh, the founders uh, of Alio, the technical founders were all co-authors on the Zexi, on a white paper called Zexi, which was kind of the technique which describes how to do zero knowledge computation. And, uh, and you know, are all, most of them were, were uh, co-founders of Zcash as well. So I will get you the exact number, but this is a, it is a, plus, it is 128 bits plus um, and I'll, I'll follow up with you on that. Now, the use case thing on why not Ethereum? You can't do this on Ethereum. Uh, you, can't, you can't achieve privacy. Why? Because in a roll-up, for example, you can do ZK at the roll-up level, but then you have to post to the call data all of the before and after state, right? And this is so people can reconstruct what happened and then verify themselves that this is correct, right? Or, and then they can know what the current state is so they can, if they withdraw, they know how much they have, right? So this is just like, by ver like at least in the roll-up model, there's no way to achieve privacy. This is why like, folks like Starkware and Polygon, there's this concept of L3s. So you can like, okay, well, you go into a roll-up, and then you can go into another roll-up, and then that's private. But then at that point, it gets a little bit, you know, that you're pretty far from the ultimate guarantee of the layer one, right? And so the motivation, in fact, Howard, who's the CTO of Alio, he originally wanted to do a layer two roll-up. But because it was really impossible to get privacy, and also because you didn't have, like, you don't have the same cryptographic primitives that you need in Ethereum to make this very performant, we decided to go the route of doing a layer one, where we could build from the ground up a system that was basically optimized just for this use case. And that's one of the reasons why the gentleman over here asked how long it took to do, how long it takes to do a transfer on Alio. I mean, if we were doing it on Ethereum, it would be on the order of 15 or 20 seconds, right? Polygon, in fact, still, they, run, they have these giant servers that run a bunch of their Stark proofs in parallel, and even then, relatively simple smart contracts interaction take on the order of 40 or 50 seconds, right? And that's because of the lack of cryptographic primitives to make this really efficient. All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Alex Roden, for coming here and uh, giving a lecture today. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.